In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. So you may know that I come from a large family. I am actually the oldest of six children. So my parents made sure that on every birthday, each one of us got just the same kind of gift as the other. And you know, funny thing, Santa Claus did the same thing. (laughs) Made sure that each one of us had exactly the same number of things in our stocking and exactly the same number of presents under under the tree. My parents did a lot to make sure that we had opportunities. Opportunities to succeed, education, tutoring, after school engagements, you know. You've done this for your children. Trying to create a level playing field for them. In today's world, I wish the playing fields were level. And I really wish we could take this parable of the workers in the vineyard and take it literally. And that the opportunities were present for all workers willing to work and that the workplace was a level playing field. Imagine a local vineyard. Okay, I know we don't have vineyards here. But imagine a workyard, a local vegetable farm, a construction site, a factory, a shop, one of our many restaurants, a school, a high-tech enterprise, and each employer just going out and hiring as many people in the day as wanted to work. Just like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire the laborers for his vineyard, construction site high-tech venture. Name the job you were looking for. And after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard to work. This employer might go out again at 9 and noon and 3 and find more, even at 5 o'clock. Maybe he'd ask the same question here in our town. Why are you standing here idle all day? Because no one has hired us, they'd say. And that could describe many of our street corners, folks at the public library on the computers, coffee shops, neighborhoods, where people are not standing idle because they want to, because no one's hired them. If we could take this parable literally, many employers would be hiring several shifts, and every day everyone would come back until all the work was done. It's a great image, isn't it? Now, where I find trouble in this parable is how the employer pays the workers. It really doesn't seem fair to those who work longer and harder to get the same amount as those who came in at the end of the day. In fact, unequal pay is an issue I really bristle at as a woman. When I started as a young banker back in New York, and I'm dating myself here, Women were making 52 cents for every dollar that a similarly qualified man was making. And while we're making progress, we still don't see equal, the 2015 stats are out, and we're up to 83 cents on the dollar. Younger women, they've done some skewing, 90 cents on the dollar. Note to self, still not 100% parity. And yes, my lens is a feminist lens. But others will have this paycheck parity discussion through the lens of the color of their skin. Others will have this paycheck parity discussion through the lens of an accent or a country of origin. So while I like this gospel story for getting lots of people employed, I get a little anxious when I hear a parable that seems to allow um, for those who have not done the work to get the same pay as those who have. And that's why we can't take this parable just at its face value. And as much as I love this image of work, and as generous as the employer is, this parable is much about much more than an opportunity to work. Remember, a parable is a short story with a hidden message about the kingdom of God. This parable is a story of invitation and mercy rather than deployment and justice in the workplace. 
This parable is about being invited into the kingdom of God on many levels and at many times. Now, the words of the parable fall first on the ears of the disciples, then, of course, on the ears of Matthew's hearers, and much later, to us. Now, when the words of the parable fall first on the ears of the disciples, these are the close friends of Jesus who have been traveling with him since the early days. They have been learning from Jesus' teaching and preaching. They've witnessed the healings. They've been controlling the growing crowds. They've fed four and 5,000 people at a time. And now they have turned toward Jerusalem with Jesus. And they're struggling to understand these predictions that Jesus is making, trying to teach them about his coming passion and death and resurrection. And now in this story, they're at the edge of the city of Jerusalem. And they look out and they say, who are all these people waiting at the entrance of the city for Jesus to arrive? Where were they in the early days, on the road, doing all the work? This parable addresses the fears of the disciples as they deal with these increasing crowds. So as Jesus is telling them this parable, perhaps the apostles and disciples who've been with Jesus from the very beginning are like those hired in the early hours of the morning. They grumbled against the landowner, remember? Saying, well, these last only worked one hour, and you have made them equal to us? All this time, should not the disciples get credit for being with Jesus all this time? More than a full day's wages compared to all those late comers? Perhaps the disciples hear Jesus' voice in the voice of the employer in the parable. Friends, don't worry. I I'm not doing you any wrong. Didn't you agree to this journey with me? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, Jesus tells them, the last will be first and the first will be last. Now, for the disciples who are about to enter Jerusalem for this final time with Jesus, these words perhaps are all too true. For Jesus is about to die once for all not just for the loyal followers, not just for those who have already met Jesus, not just for their families and their friends, but Jesus is about to die once for all, for all in their present time, for all those who had gone before them, and for all those yet to come. And in the resurrection, Jesus is alive for all. Now, some 50 years later, this parable falls on the ears of Matthew's hearers. Now, in the time of Matthew, the followers of Jesus have new generations following them. The issue in this time is that Jesus' followers expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. And Jesus has not yet returned. There is worry that those who do not see Jesus will not be welcome in his kingdom. Why hasn't Jesus come back to save our families too? Now, to those who are at the alive at the time of Jesus are starting to die. And the sons and daughters who were too young to remember are getting worried. Are they like the latecomers in the vineyard? They've not earned their kingdom privileges yet. Are these second-generation followers hearing the words of the employer in the parable, maybe with some relief. The words of Jesus saying, the last shall be first. So does that mean we next gens can get in? They are learning that the entrance into the kingdom is not based on what we do, but is based on who God is. So now, what does this parable say for us? as these words reach our ears centuries later. When we hear this gospel passage, are we considering our own journey of faith? Some in our churches 
have been cradle Episcopalians. Some have faith that has been built up in other denominations, Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, Roman Catholics, in Orthodox traditions like the Greeks and the Armenians, and some come to this table from different faiths. Now I know there are some here who have never known a time when they did not work in the vineyard of God's kingdom. Others of us have come to the faith maybe at 9 o'clock in the morning, some at noon, some more like the 5 o'clock of our lives. So this hidden message about the kingdom of, the, of God is this. God is generous. God is filled with mercy. And God is always inviting us in. For God, the kingdom question is not how many can we invite into the kingdom of God. It is about how we can invite people and not the criteria for keeping people out. We are an industrious people here at St. Paul's. In this part of God's garden, we have prepared for many ministries that will serve our members, our friends, our families, anyone who walks in from the corner, anyone we come in contact with in our lives, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. We have many ministries here that will serve people near and far. So we've got a great vineyard. Let's be as generous as the owner of that vineyard in the parable. Let's go out into the streets, into our neighborhoods, and find all those laborers to join us in this harvest. For the kingdom of God is right here. Amen.